Okay. And he is here to talk to us about the basics of farm succession. David Marison, thank you for coming out today. I'll go ahead and let you get started, sir. And you should be able to share your screen. All righty. We'll do the share screen first and then make sure we're okay. So you see a full slide, JT? Yes, I do. All right. So we're good to go. And um, I want to say thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, JT, if you'll watch the chat, if there's any chat and you need to interrupt, um, please do that. The way it you know, pulls up on my screen, I can't see the chat. So if there is um, something that comes up in the chat button, just let me know. I would, I would encourage that. So tonight, Basics of Farm Succession, the picture that you're seeing right now is my family farm. That's my grandfather's farm. Uh, st uh, started back in the early 1900s. And you can see there's like three sections there that were built on over time. But that is my grandfather's farm. That's where we milk cows, dairy cows up in Ashtabula County up until 2010. And through the, um, through the estate process, that farm is now I own my grandfather's farm, um, even though I am in Coshocton County. So I've been with OSU Extension since 1997. Prior to that, I taught out in the state of Indiana five years, um, high school agriculture at North Montgomery High School. Prior to that, I worked for Disney World for a stretch and, um, and I grew up on this farm that you see here. So I had the pleasure of being up in Asheville County for 23 years. And then as life happens, um, I, I moved um, um, with, a, a, with a remarriage. And you'll hear some of that as we go through tonight's um, program, but that's the farm I still own. That's a, and that's the hay we made um, last summer. So a lot of the stories and my interest in farm succession, of course, started right here on this farm. And then as early in my extension career, I just saw the pure need of the different um, farm succession nightmares that I was seeing. And I'll start that off right there with the fact that I think every family has a little bit of dysfunctionality. And I think if we admit that right off, then we will all work through the farm succession process a lot better because there is no perfect family. There are no perfect people, which means that you know, when you get into sometimes contentious, sometimes very difficult conversations to have with about the future of the farm, uh, of course, that throws us even into more dysfunctionality. Just so just know that every family's in that. But uh, we have a short time. What we're going to do here is do the quick overview tonight. 360 degree or feet view of this. Now, this is typically a course that OSU Extension we offer in a two day series, two full day workshops in person. Of course, the coronavirus altered that. This year, we transformed that program into a three evening uh, workshop. So, we actually condensed a two day workshop to three evenings. So, what you're going to get tonight is you're going to get a little flavor of that, um, those workshops that we do. And if you have in interest in that, in the future, of course, contact me, um, contact JT, contact Brady. Um, if it's something that you think that maybe you want a more in-depth look at this, as we move back to our in-person programming, I don't think we've offered this over in Butler County in, in my career. So it's time, JT, that we come over and do maybe a two-day workshop or a one-day intensive workshop on this. So tonight, we're going to give you the overview, um, just as, as far as my... Um, disclaimer, it's not legal or tax advice. We encourage you to consult your accountant and attorney with specific tax and legal questions. Acknowledgements on this presentation. Of course, Peggy Kirk Hall is amazing. She's our OSU and our OSU Ag and Resource Law Program. Um, she put a lot of effort into our workshop. Some of her slides will show up here this evening, uh, as well as we've worked in partnership with Robert Moore from Wright and Moore Law Company um, out of um, Dublin, Ohio. And Robert's just been a good friend to us and, and allowing us to ground truth in a lot of what we teach in, in the class. And actually, he comes on in our workshops and does some Q&A with producers. So we start out with why don't farm families plan better for the transition of their, of their farm? And um, I think typical reasons. And um, if we were in person, we would get a lot more. And we have a couple of polls, but what, what some typical reasons that might be holding us back? And this is what we see from farm families, reasons why they say, that, well, this is why we're not doing farm succession. Of course, first one, we just don't have time. I mean, I don't, I have never met a farmer that says, oh, I just have all this time on my hands. I mean, and now specifically we're getting to, into spring, we're focusing our attention into field operations. 
we just don't have the time to do what we um, need to do when it comes to farm succession. I think the big one, it's uncomfortable to talk about death. I don't know how many of you have sat around a Thanksgiving or Easter um, dinner table and, and talked about your mortality, talked about what happens to the farm after grandma, grandpa dies. Well, those are just tough, uncomfortable conversations. Many of us don't like to talk about death. Uh, I personally think it, it's something that we should be talking about more um, is about what happens, especially when, when we have a business. What happens to that business when we are not in charge of that? Hopefully that transition occurs before we die, but oftentimes that transi transition does occur because someone passed away. Of course, family conflict, as I mentioned early, uh, all families have some sort of dysfunctionality. So there's bound to be family conflict, especially when you have family members that live on the farm, work on the farm, and then you have the other part of the family that may have appreciated and grown up in that farm, but yet have maybe moved on to careers that have taken them outside the community. Um, but yet there may be something in play when the, that estate transfers to the next generation. I mean, we don't know how or what to do. And this specifically comes, there's a lot of fancy terms like uh, revocable trust, irrevocable trust. Uh, we don't know about these things called LLCs. We don't know, um, should we um, be putting more in retirement? Should we be using life insurance policies as part of this transition plans? What about this? Um, things called payable on death, transferable on death, or maybe a buy-sell agreement. So there's lots of um, things that can be confusing. Um, and that's why we do these programs. We do these programs hoping to, to open up um, and make, make it a little easier. Because I think once you delve into it, there is not an issue. And there's not a problem that um, good estate planning attorneys can't help you with that. And that leads us to the next one. Lawyers are expensive. I said, well, I'm not going to do anything because lawyers are expensive. All they're, all they're worrying about is taking my, my money. Well, I think the research will show that if you do nothing, your estate, it will cost your estate more um, because of some of the things that could potentially happen in that transfer process. And then we don't agree on what we should happen, what should happen. Now, this often happens, mom and dad, maybe grandma and grandpa. Um, between generations, we don't agree on what should happen. It could be as simple as which child, um, uh, what, what, um, what, and I see the quote, I thought the topic was succession planting. So yeah, plant your um, early season crops right now. And then later this um, summer, you could plant something else. And that's all I know about succession planting. Um, but you don't agree on what should happen, um, and that oftentimes happens in families. Husband and wives don't agree, or maybe there's some other reason that's holding you back. So uh, some of the um, farm transition scenarios, do any of these sound familiar to you? Grandpa still makes all the decisions for the farm. It's worked fine for all these years, and there's no need to change. And Grandpa's going to make those decisions until he's um, 90, 95. Or maybe Grandma's 87, still in charge of all the farm account books. Lawyers are greedy and I don't understand LLC, trust, wills. Mom and dad won't talk about the future. Can I afford to farm if I have to buy out my seven siblings? And we'll show that maybe a little bit later. My mom and dad just won't say what's gonna happen about the um, farm. Maybe you get this comment, don't worry kids, this will, all, this will all be your someday. And because it's gonna be all your someday, we're gonna pay you less. We're gonna let you live in the rundown old farmhouse that needs a lot of work. But don't worry, because this will all be yours someday. And ultimately, what we see happens is you no know, plan is in place. And then everybody gets their piece of the pie. And that means the, the child that stayed behind with a lot of that sweat equity um, doesn't get rewarded for that sweat equity. Or maybe this is a situation I helped a farm family with here just this past month. We have no children. What do we do? We don't basically have um, the children to pass this on to. But what they did have were heirs and they they did identify an heir for that farm it just didn't happen to be a blood relative or maybe none of the kids have the interest in the farm or maybe my kids hate each other so how can I lead the farm to them to farm together if they hate each other or I farm with my brother and we each have three children who gets the farm so you got six children is there enough income for those six children probably not so which one out of the six gets to be the one that um, inheritance, inherits the farm, maybe manages the farm. How can we do that? I love my kids and I want to bless them equally. In other words, I want to make sure 
on the day that I pass that my estate is divided equally between the kids. And if that's the case, then the question presents itself, um, can the farm, can the farm be maintained as an operational farm for the future? Or maybe you're worried about what happens afterwards. My dad has passed and now mom who owns all the land is dating a new man. And what do we do about that situation where potentially the farm may leave the family because of a remarriage? Or this is what we usually get in the back of the room as people are going to the restroom. I really don't trust my daughter-in-law. She's sitting here in the room. I can't ask the question, but I don't want to leave the farm to my son because I don't trust my daughter-in-law. So those are just some of the questions and some of the things that might hold people back. But I try to put this um, in perspective as about, so what is holding you back? Um, what's gonna be your trigger? And we, we understand that through life, there are certain triggers which will push us into doing some planning. So what's the trigger going to be? And my challenge would be to you is what is your trigger to put plans in the place? So this could be for your personal state. This could be for the farm business. Well, this could be for a lot of things in life, but what's gonna be your trigger? So I ask these three questions because this, these were the triggers. I'll share the triggers that were in my life about preparing your farm family and yourself. So I look at it in three manners about as you make preparations, I don't, it doesn't matter what order this is, uh, but I believe that you need to give intentional, intentional work to each of these areas about the future. So first about preparing your farm. If you only had seven weeks to live, what are the most important things you would need to do to consider um, for your farm to continue without you? So you can see in the upper right hand um, picture, there's my dad right there. Um, uh, this was 2010, May 1st, 2010. My dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So, you know, pancreatic cancer is an ugly, ugly cancer. And um, for my dad, that meant that uh, in the stage and the progression it was, we, he had seven weeks to live and that's what happened. Uh, of course, on a dairy farm in Northeast Ohio, May 1st, cows are out on pasture, we're planting crops, trying to do all these things at the same time that my dad is going through um, radiation and chemotherapy. And what kind of things did we need to know for that farm to continue? I can tell you what, in those seven weeks, I learned a tremendous amount about the farm that I would not like to have had shoved all in seven weeks. So to know that I could maintain that farm after dad was gone. So that's preparing your farm. Secondly, about your family. If you were diagnosed with a cancer that has no cure, what would be the most important things you would need to do for your family? And on the other picture there is my two daughters, Gidget and Annalise, and there is my late wife, Jamie. Jamie was diagnosed. Uh, my dad passed away in June. And in December, my wife was diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer. And uh, again, that's a cancer that has no cure. And Jamie fought that valiantly for four and a half years. Um, but for your family, um, what, what kind of things do you need to do if if you are gonna be gone, whether that's you or your spouse for your family to go forward. Um, very difficult to um, tell a 14 year old daughter, um, you know, your mom's not gonna be here for all those major things in the life. So what, what can you do to prepare your family? And then finally, if your plane crashed today, would you be ready to die? So that's, that's about yourself. And I was on a plane and um, back in December of 2016, going out of Columbus to fly down to North Carolina to do a farm succession program. And, uh, the plane that the right engine, see the right engine there caught on fire. And I thought for sure we were goners. My mental calculation was we had a 50% chance to survive. Um, thankfully, um, as you can tell, um, things turned out fine. We had a nice escort our own, own runway to land on with um, all the emergency vehicles and, and whatnot. But I guess the question would be is if your plane crashed today, would you be ready to die? So are you prepared? Um, for that, um, and just, so, just something to think about. But as we get into farm transition planning, farm succession planning, and I'll use those, you'll hear me use those words interchangeably between succession and transition. They mean the same thing. It's that transition, that's a succession from this generation to the next. So you have that side of the stool, which is transition planning. Then on the other side of the stool is the estate planning. So that's the nuts and the bolts. That's the LLCs, that's the trust. Those are all the mechanics that the um, 
an agriculture attorney will help you to um, push your farm um, through the estate process. But you notice the, the leg of the stool that I put right in the middle, and that's family dynamics. We can help you transition plan. We can really help you with estate plan. But it's really what's going to drive um, the success, the ultimate success of this planning process for those two is that leg right there in the middle of the family dynamics. And as I mentioned before, the, there's going to be some dysfunctionality in each of those families. The question you're for your family and the question for yourself is, are you going to be willing to let those dysfunctionalities stand in your way of putting a plan in place for the future? And this isn't a plan that you do today and then walk away from it. It's a plan that you do and then you review it. And there's intentionality through the entire process that you're doing certain things along the way. I wrote my trust plan for the farm five years ago. And I'll tell you, I'm in a major revamp of that because of life events right now. So when you think of this future of your farm, think of these three legs on the stools. But tonight we're specifically talking about um, the estate planning. Uh, first is, I hope it didn't make you too dizzy there as my cursor is um, messing up there. What is your goal for the future of the farm? So JT, I believe we have a poll on this. So if you want to pull, there's a, uh, not that one. Uh, go to poll. I should have. We'll leave that one clear to the end. So pop that one down. Go to the second poll. It, which, which should say what will happen to the future um, farm in the, in the future. So go ahead and take a second to um, answer that. So do you want to pass it on as a farm business? Do you want to sell it as a business? In other words, somebody else is going to run it. Do I want to pass it on to my children, heirs, as an asset to manage? In other words, they become landlords. My, I'm, I'm going to let my heirs decide what to do with the farm. Or maybe I sell the farm. When I die, they sell the farm, and the proceeds are distributed to my heirs. Maybe I don't know yet. So JT, at least we got, there's five, we got one holdout left, um, but you can probably stop the share and we'll just share the results with everybody. This just helps me as I'm looking at this poll, pass it on the, to, um, as a farm business, 40%. I think that's what we all want to do. We own a farm and we love that farm. We, that is our desire, right? To, as a farm business, 20% um, pass it on to my um, children, heirs as an asset to manage. I can tell you that's where my family is. Um, after my passing, my girls will be, and um, another heir will be using that as an asset to manage. Don't know yet, and other. So um, we'll um, see what, hopefully, uh, if you want to chat what the other is, I would be intrigued to hear that. And JT, I just closed that down. So, and Jane, thank you. Uh, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger, right? Um, but it's um, really shaped um, a lot of things in my life, so. So we'll, let's start on that first about who are your heirs. I mentioned uh, the family that I've been working with about they don't have heirs. Well, there was a young gentleman in the farming community, um, in their community, um, that they have had a relationship with us, a new beginning farmer, and he's doing a great job. And they just really adore um, this young man. And the young man's doing a great job. So, um, okay, land conservation trust, that's beautiful. So you're putting it into an easement, that's, that's great. Another way you can do that. Who are your heirs? So I was about this couple and their intent is now that um, this young man is joining in on the operation to farm together for a few years. And then in the future, it will be able um, to not only inherit some of the property, but then also um, through the estate process may inherit some of that property as well. So I guess if I put this triangle up on here for you to look at, what will your heirs do? If you had to mark on this and in, in the soil scientists, we'll have the soil triangle, it's different textures. So Brady, I'm just walking into your world there in soil and water conservation district. But if you had to put a star on this triangle, when you think about your heirs, where would you put, where do you think they are on this triangle? Do they wanna own or operate that business? Over here, where they maybe own and rent as an investment, or down the bottom, I think this is the fear of many parents of would they want to sell the asset? So where would you put um, them on that? And that's where you can start driving your um, discussions with your heirs. In fact, 
this triangle in our, in our farm succession workshops, we're encouraging you to ask their, your heirs, if you inherited this farm, you know, what's your future for the farm? What do you think about the farm? What, what would you want to see with the farm? Would you want to inherit the farm? What would you do with the farm if you had it? And start to have those conversations, um, especially if you're worried about the relationship between sons and daughters as going forward, it's a great chance to see where they're all standing. And here's some questions again. Uh, there's a lot of questions here about in our in-depth workshops, we would go into these real deep and specific. I'm going to give you the, the overview. First, the current financial position and viability of the farm. What's a, what's a financial position? Number one, are you making money now? And if you're making money um, or have the potential to, uh, how does the next generation fit into that? Does that mean the next generation can come and farm together with you going forward um, and have enough net family income for both generations? Or is this something that when the farm passes, that's when they'll take over that ownership management and then having the opportunity to have financial returns from the operation. So what is the current financial position? I will say there are lots of farms in the state that the junior generation is working with the senior generation and has never seen the balance sheet or the books. Does the farm generate enough income for multiple generations? It comes down to what is your family living expenses? What is the desired family living expenses? And does a farm have enough gross returns to be able to pay all the bills, pay for those principal payments, as well as pay for that let living expenses. Um, we have some small farms that um, the goal from the farm is for it not to lose money and make maybe make three, four thousand dollars and they have an off off farm income. Where in other respects, we want the farm to generate a, le a living expense, um, family living of seventy thousand dollars for our, for our family. So what is the farm's income potential? That may include what are some things that we, we aren't doing now that maybe we could do in the future that would expand our income. And what would a SWOT analysis reveal? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, we would take at every aspect of the business, look at the SWOT, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, looking at the in-depth dive at that. What is your current and future organization structure look like? Um, so if there's more than one person involved with the farm, what does that organizational chart look like structure? Who answers the two, who? And then how will that transition or change as you move from one generation to the next? Does your heir want to own and operate the farm in the future? I'm shocked by the number of heirs who've never been asked, do you wanna own and operate the farm in the future? If multiple par parties are involved, can we get along? So I've seen situations where grandma and grandpa will say, well, we're gonna leave it to the two boys. Are now with LLCs uh, with being the flavor of the day in estate planning. Uh, we're, we have two brothers that are farming together and they have those six kids like we talked about in the slide at the beginning. So we're just gonna leave on the land and the whole business to the six grandkids and an LLC and then they're just going to manage it together. Well, we have to ask the question, number one, is it enough income for that to happen? And secondly, can all those parties, when they come together, can they get along um, to run that business? What involvement will the non-farming heirs have in the future of the farm? Will the non-farm heirs own part of the farm that maybe a brother or sister is farming? Um, will they have an involvement in the, in the family farm or not? So there's lots of issues to address as we go through the succession planning process. Um, first of all, we'll get it right out of the, is the unexpected. Uh, a lot of times these are called the Ds um, and we think about death. Um, I think we're all gonna die, right? So, but, so it shouldn't be unexpected. I think just the timing of when it happens is unexpected to many of us. So we have to deal about death, disability. You know, farming is a, an occupation that is very dangerous. Um, I think the second most dangerous occupation. So if we have an instance where there's a disability with one of the principal managers of the farms, how are we gonna overcome that? A divorce and second marriages. I mentioned that at the beginning about what happens. 
when there's a, a, a second marriage, maybe after someone passes away and you remarry, how will that alter the farm situation? And we understand here in the state of Ohio that 60%, and I'm gonna say that again, 60% of all marriages end in divorce. So if we are thinking about the viability and protecting the farm business for the future, what kind of, kind of conversations are we having about remarriages and about divorce? And should that be part of our structure, um, plan and purpose structure of our operating agreements in our ag business? Long-term care, what happens if someone goes into a nursing home? How are you gonna come over that, overcome that cost? You know, that could be $100,000 or more a year. Average nursing home stay is over three years. So if that is average, if things are average, how will you come up with the 300, 250 to $300,000 for that nursing home stay? Medical bills, and, and that kind of ties into with that. What happens is if there's unexpected medical bills that then will take income away from the farm uh, that you're not putting back into equipment and machinery into land acquisition and those type of things. All right, maybe not having enough adequate retirements. This is a situation where Grandpa can't retire. Grandpa's got to keep farming because we've done such a great job at tax mitigation that we don't we have not paid anything into Social Security. So I can't retire. Or if I do retire, then that means the next generation as they're farming is probably going to have to make a rental payment or a retirement payment so that I can retire. So do we have have we done some planning for retirement? Maybe it's buying out a business partner. Uh, oftentimes when we have two brothers farming together, uh, one brother um, is retiring or exiting the business. Maybe he passes away and the wife and children will inherit that farm. But then the other brother has to buy their share out. So is there the money? Has there been a plan for buying out that business partner? And we're in a very litigious society, which means could there be an unexpected lawsuit? Absolutely. And how would that impact us? These are the things that keep me up at night. And global issues. Think of 2020, we started off the year so great and then coronavirus pandemic. How did that alter our farming operations across the uh, state and across the nation? Had huge impacts on some, others have weathered it really well, but with global issues like a pandemic, we think about the trade disputes that we had with China. Did that impact corn and soybean producers, especially soybean producers? Absolutely. So uh, in your back of your mind, on tractor time, you should be thinking about how do I overcome all of these unexpected events? And then I'll even push it one, one step further about what are the elephants in the room that might be holding you back? These are the undiscussables. I think I wrote an article for a local newspaper in here in Eastern Ohio that said, what are the elephants in the barn? Change it to a farm vernacular, but what are the elephants in the room that may hold up planning? Mentioned one at the beginning about, I don't trust my daughter-in-law who's married to my son, who's part of the, the farm operation. And I'm worried about the farm's viability if something were to happen, that 60% chance of divorce. Maybe I'm, I'm concerned about a remarriage after I die as I'm the senior partner. So what are the elephants in the room this could go back for 20, 30 years. It could have been something that happened because you know families have long memories, like elephants have long memories. What happened 30 years ago that might be holding up and throw a wrench into the planning that we have? And if there are elephants in the room, it could be, I want to leave some money to my son or my daughter, but I tell you what, they have a substance abuse problem. They have a, a, a hurt or a hang up that I am afraid that if I give them an inheritance, that that may even make that hurt or hang up even um, accentuate that. So is there some things that I can do? And I, I'll say, if you identify these elephants in the room and you go to your attorney and you're honest with your attorney, these are the things that I am worried about. A competent attorney can take every elephant in the room and help you mitigate that to their best of their ability for the things that, that that might be holding you up. One of those might be this situation. Should heirs be equal, treated equally in unequal situations? So here you have Robert in this picture. Robert, um, this is a $2.1 million estate. 
And you can see Robert has one, two, three, four, five, six brothers and sisters. So there's seven siblings in all. So if we do the quick math, if this was divided equally, so Robert's farmed there all his life, oftentimes for less money. Mom and dad do no planning. So it comes to where it's split up equally. So you do the math, 2.1 million divided by seven, $300,000 per children per child. So here's Robert in this situation, wanting to farm and $2.1 million state in today's agriculture, it's, it's a small operation. So does Robert have the equity when mom and dad die, both die, does Robert have the equity or has he made the plans to overcome that, that he has $1.8 million because that's what it would take six times 300,000. Would he be able to have enough money to buy out his brothers and sisters so that he could farm in the future. Again, if this is an elephant in the room, the elephant in the room dealing with your attorney in your financial planners, there are some, some opportunities that Robert could do to, to help him if he knows that this is gonna be the case, that he can maybe mitigate it on his side, or maybe if mom and dad's who ultimate goal is, is their goal to treat all the kids equally or is their goal to maintain that farm as a farm business for multiple generations going forward depending on that answer maybe mom and dad um, can help robert in this situation and then that talks about sweat equity how do you calculate the value of the son or daughter who stayed on the farm don't sweat it we got you covered we're going to pay you less blah 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 and usually that doesn't happen i will tell you there's a a man by Dave, name of David Gaylor out of the University of Nebraska, he's retired now, but did a, uh, an analysis of how you could do this through the use of balance sheets, through um, de determining uh, the amount of equity growth that happened in that business, how much of that can be attributed to mom and dad's generation and then to the, to the junior generation. So if this is a situation that you're facing, you can, just like we can look at a tree that's been cut down and we can actually tell how old that tree was or how big that tree is. There are some things that you can do, even in hindsight, maybe this has been happening for 20 years that you can do in hindsight that will help um, equalize this situation for the son or daughter who might have stayed on the farm and has sweat equity. My observation here would be is that if you have a son or daughter that's working on the farm operation, they should be paid at a rate that they would get at any competing farm that they would go to. In other words, don't say, we're gonna pay you less because of this. And it's kind of like the wimpy, uh, if you uh, give me a burger today, I'll give you two tomorrow. I think that was out of um, Popeye, right? I think you should pay them, my belief you should pay them what they're worth now. That way you don't have to do the evening and the score at the end. Um, and I would even say farming, you know, son or daughter who stayed on the farm. But I also think about, too, about all this, the, un, the uncalculated things that kids do for their parents. Just because a son or daughter stayed on the farm and is working hard, there may be another son or daughter in the backdrop that's doing things for mom and dad on the medical side and on the off-farm side that maybe needs to be calculated into this as well. And of course, communication, uh, warning, I'm not listening. Are there communication issues? And in, a, in, our, in our full program, we talk about uh, barriers to communication. Of course, this is not an easy subject. Farmers aren't known for communication. Uh, we would go more in depth. The mixed role of being a parent and a business partner, being a son and daughter and being a business partner is hard. All of our farms have languages. We, we speak in code. In fact, all our businesses do, right? Um, we refer to land that we're farming. You know, we refer to, for us, it was like, I'm going over to the Lautenan farm. Well, it hasn't been the Lautenan farm for three generations. It's actually the Gruce Gravich farm, but everyone refers to it as the Lautenan farm. When you get in that situation as an in-law, uh, you're trying to learn all the language uh, that might not even make sense. And of course, personality differences. We all have personality differences. How do you deal through those personality differences? Introvert versus extrovert, and generational differences. 
you know, we know baby boomers are different than Gen Xers. We know Gen Xers are different than millennials. And then we got this Generation Z. You put them all together on a farm um, operation. Uh, the way my grandpa worked, sun up to sun down, you make hay while the sun shines, may not be the same strategy that a millennial will use if they're involved in, in an operation. And are there differences in, in genders? Absolutely. There are. So if there are some differences there that are holding us back with communication, uh, the big thing that we would encourage you to do is identifying the stressors and your communication barriers that are slowing you down. And then find ways and extension. We have great programs to help you through this process, to help you identify and then help you to do some, uh, give you some strategies to overcome those. So some of those strategies would include First, identifying the elephants in the room. Identify the ways to minimize stress. We all have stressors. And the key to a marriage, the key to family relationships, is we understand what causes stress in our family members. Are there ways that we as a business can operate to help minimize those stress? I, I think of one who, you know, son, son is a millennial. He's farming with dad. The kids have a soccer game in town. It's during planting season. And the older generation says, we can't stop. We got to keep planting. But the stress that that causes on that young person, because they know that they should be watching their child play their sport, plus with their spousal relationships. Is there a way of business we can say, hey, we're going to shut down for a couple hours. We're all going to go watch the soccer game. And oh, by the way, we already checked the weather forecast. We can come back after we put the kids to, to bed and then plant um, starting at 10 o'clock at night. And for millennials, they may be happier at doing that at 10 o'clock at night than missing their child's soccer game at six o'clock at night. So look at those things that you can do to help restress um, the stress, the communication, take time for crucial conversations. You know, many of us were involved in 4-H, many of us involved in FFA, both great, great youth development um, organizations. The one thing that we do in those two organizations is we talk about how to run an effective meeting. And we do that for plan and purpose. The plan and purpose is that we're developing these young people to be leaders in their community in the future, to be on school boards, to be on the church boards. But even more importantly, that is why are we not using those concepts that we learn on business meetings in 4-H and FFA? And why aren't we using those to help run our business meetings for our business and actually go through and have those meetings with our family about our business. So if you think about planning for transition of control, uh, I, I like to look at this two ways. First, an owner operator, I'm gonna prepare my son or my daughter to take over the farm. So what you should do is be making a list of everything that we do, everything that we do on the farm. And it is my goal as a senior generation to make sure on the day that I die, I have taught, I taught the next generation everything that they need to know to build them up for success in that operation. So that could be livestock and crop production management. That could be the marketing of commodities. Like a lot of folks don't get to, to market their first truckload of soybean or corns until dad has passed away. Financial and tax management, about running the record keeping, doing the taxes, all the things about maintaining the facilities, machinery and infrastructure. Um, earlier this afternoon, I, we had bought a new house here in Coshocton, and when you know it, I'm having a septic issue. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have a map to know where the clean-out trap for that septic um, should be when it's buried three feet under the ground? So I want to have to dig like a little gopher out there and try to find where that clean-out trap is. So lots of those things on our farm, um, time after time after time, which I just wish dad would have told me this. So that I would know, because on farms, we do a lot of crazy things. We'll run a water line across and an electric line over here. And we know where those all are, especially if I'm a grandchild. Do I know where grandpa put that 35 years ago? Employment, employee management. How are we managed employees if we have them? And then risk management. All those crop insurance, things that we need to teach them. Dealing with the farm service agency. Everything that goes with risk management, selecting insurance, building insurance to crop insurance. How do we teach them up? So you have the, the side of the coin where you're, you're developing the, 
next generation to manage the farm. And I know that 20% on this call said, well, I'm, I have to school them up to be a landlord. They're not gonna farm the ground. They're gonna have their day job, but they love the farm. And they're gonna keep the farm and they're gonna manage that farm and they're gonna rent that ground out. They're gonna rent those facilities out to another farmer in their community. So our preparation of that next generation is different. We're thinking about tenant farmer relationships. How do we execute those lease agreements? Uh, we're teaching them about doing their financials and the tax management to make sure that they're, as a landlord, that they're making a good return on their investment. And is there any risk management part of that that they need to um, be part of? And then how do they roll into maintaining facilities? Maybe they're renting out some farm equipment for a while. Um, what are some things we can do to help them be a, the best landlord that they can be in the future? Uh, and that's um, to prepare them that, hey, we have to have these lease agreements. We, we have to have those relationships in the community and how, how's the best way to do that? So if I had the, the next manager, some questions that I would ask the next generation is, if you had to take over the farm today, what would you be the most concerned about? What are some things that I need to be schooled up in? Maybe I'm that next generation that's coming back to the farm. What changes need to be made for me to have a continuing interest in the business? And then the next manager, that next generation says, what are my, we they need to look themselves in the mirror and say, what are my weaknesses? And how am I gonna overcome those weaknesses? So I'm a better manager for that farm in the future. And then ultimately, what is your ex expectation for an appropriate time for management control to be transferred? Uh, if you're that next generation coming back to the farm, when do I get to step up and make different decisions along the way? And having a plan and purpose senior generation to make sure that that's happening so that the first time that they make a decision is not with you, with you not being there because you've passed on. So some tips um, for transition management, especially if you're bringing them back to run, over, run the farm, employment at another business before returning home, have clear job descriptions, have a plan and purpose for how responsibilities are increased as their abilities are developed. Maybe you have the successors have their own enterprise and expertise within the farm business. You wanna have a new venture? Well, that means the son and daughter, they go out, they get the loan, the operating loan for that enterprise. They make all the decisions and you build up their capacity slowly. They are learning there why they're learning the enterprises which you have traditionally raised on your farm. And then embrace the idea of sharing. Farm business meetings are great for this, sharing the cash flows, the budgets, the business plans. And of course, um, regardless if it's a generation that's gonna run the farm, our generation that's gonna be a landlord, you need to develop their relationship with the advisors. That's your, your folks at the lending institutions that you may be using um, at all the different places that you're marketing your commodities at. Um, if they've never been to the auction where you sell everything, are you taking them and having a plan for that to happen? And then of course, giving ongoing feedback. I showed two pictures here because this, this is my, um, these are my secrets. So here's two of my secrets on transferring control. First one will start on the right. This is a calendar. 365 days in the year. That means you have 365 days as an operator, as the senior manager, to teach the next generation one thing about the, the operation that they don't know today. So if you start that on January 1st, by the time you hit the end of the year, that's 365 new things that they have in their toolbox to be able to manage that farm. And if I'm smart as the junior generation, not only are mom and dad teaching me one thing a year, I'm asking them one thing that I really want to know. So when you times 365 times two, now we're close to 800 things that we learned by the end of the year. If that doesn't work, we got this cute little creature here called a possum. And mom and dad, here's what I say to do. Pick the nicest day and we get into the month of May. Leave a note on the door and say, um, we took a vacation for three weeks. Good luck. So you play possum. You play dead. Beauty about playing dead is that you get to come back. 
because that's what a possum does, right? So you can play dead, leave them for a while, two, three weeks, let the junior generation run the operation. And then by the time you get back, they're going to be filled with questions to ask you. As we get into our farm succession uh, workshops, the, we really delve deep into the legal side. Of course, you have all these words and um, Peggy does a great job. So I would encourage you to enroll in one of our more intensive workshops. But I just thinking of some of the things that Peggy would share with you, you know, when you're thinking about when you go have those conversations with an attorney, here's some of the things that the attorney is gonna be asking. Is there gonna be a federal estate tax issue? Right now, probably not. But if the rumors I'm hearing in Washington, D.C. are true, there may be cause for concern in the future. Um, what's the financial situation? They're going to want to know the financial situation. They're going to want to know the assets. They're going to want to know which of that, those assets are on the farm side and which of those on the non-farm side. Are there special needs? Again, these could go into the elephants in the room, special needs that must be addressed. So this may be caring for a son and daughter who has special needs, and maybe you want to part the, put the not maybe, maybe, you will have that part of your estate plan and how are they yet gonna be managed? What pieces do you already have done and what needs to be changed? So the last thing you wanna have is have those discussions about the elephants in the room in front of the attorney because you're, you're on their clock when that happens. So the more of this that you've had planned out, the more things that you have thought about ahead of time, that's money that you're giving yourself because you're not sitting having those conversations in front of the attorney. Um, the attorney's going to need a balance sheet, list of assets, list of your heirs, um, the business entities, uh, everything that you have existing, like wills, powers of attorneys, a list of your advisors. Now, one thing that I have put together, and you see that on the screen there, is getting your farm and family affairs in order. So, Brady, um, when I send this to you and JT, you can get it out to the entire group, or you can um, email me for this. This getting your farm and family affairs in order is like a 60 page document. This is where you summarize everything that you see on the right side of the screen. So you're putting all the balance sheet, putting all your assets, you're putting all your family information, you're putting the wills and powers of attorneys and the health care power of attorneys, the living wills, all that stuff goes in there. In fact, you're going to find all the titles to all your property to show how they are designated because a lot of it can happen through transfer on death or through the title process. So do you have that all together? I guarantee if you take this document and you put it all into a notebook, you're gonna save yourself a couple thousand dollars when it goes to the time that you go to visit your attorney. So look forward to that and I encourage you to go through that and pull it together. It takes some time, but it's well worth the investment of time that you're gonna put into it. And then we have fact sheets um, in our program where actually Peggy and I put together checklists. And these checklists will give you a roadmap on the things that you need to do um, to get everything in order for your attorney. So as I mentioned, federal state tax is worth um, well, right now, as we sit in 2021, we each have $11.7 .7 million worth of, of exemption, which means my state is $11.7 .7 million. It can get to my next generation free and clear with no estate tax at the federal level or the Ohio level. And that's indexed for inflation. What we do see in the year 2026, this reverts back because this was through some tax changes. It will revert back to $5 million per person. Now, what does the Biden administration do um, in the future? There's been talk that maybe that individual exemption goes back to three and a half. I heard the other day, I even I, I shuddered to hear that it, there was talk about going back to a million dollars per person, which really Im, will impact farms if that happens. Big thing is to know is what is your estate when you all add it all up together, what's it's worth, and then your attorney is going to walk through and then be able to help you mitigate whatever level is going to be here. And we don't know what it's gonna be, um, what is gonna happen. Uh, we, well, big thing I would say is don't fall asleep on Congress. Don't fall asleep with what's happening in Washington, DC. Make sure you're watching that. And of course, I'll be watching for those extension programs on this because it may change. So what pieces do you have um, through our program? You need a will, you will need a power of attorney. You'll need the healthcare power of attorney. Uh, trust, giving plan, LLCs, LLC operating, buy-sell agreements. 
Um, this is a whole program in itself. So if that's something that you want in the future, um, I'm sure that um, Brady and JT can get that pulled together for you. Um, but just think about these are some of the things that I'm just showing you two screenshots here of some things that could happen. You have your your assets. Um, it will some of them can be transferable on death or payable on death, like our bank accounts or survivorship, like on some of our land. There could be insurance in some of those that will transfer naturally just upon your death to your beneficiaries. But other things will flow through a will. Everybody should have a will, even if you have a trust. Others will decide that maybe they need a trust because of the complexity of what they need to do. But if assets that go through the will process could end up through the probate court and then to your beneficiaries, uh, the beauty of a trust is those assets will go into the trust, the trust distributes those, and basically you're bypassing that probate process. There's pros and cons to both sides of wills, trust. The important thing to do to remember is don't do something that's just because that's what your attorney tells you to do. Every family is going to be different. It's going to be a combination of the things that you see on the screen. I have transferable on deaths. I have payables on death. I have a will. I have a trust. They're all going to work in harmony together to ultimately get to the final goal, which is what to do with the family farm that you saw in that first slide. So here, here's another example of where a trust was used because mom and dad um, have a non-farming child and two non-farming children and the farming child. And then they have the um, farming child three actually gets to lease the land until that when mom or dad dies, whoever dies first, the lease of the land, the farming child will be able to lease that land until the death of the second spouse. And then there'll be some of the, a third of the land goes to the farming child. And then the farming child has the option to buy two thirds at a discount. And then those two thirds of that will then be able to be given back to the non-farming child one and child two. Bottom line of showing this, there is a picture for every family. My picture on this screen looks completely different than JT's would be. So everything, you will put a picture together to make it all work. And all the elephants that you have in the room will be addressed by your attorney um, so that your plan works out um, and you can overcome those special needs. Um, maybe you have some, some issues that you're really worried about. You can take care of it through the estate process. So I guess the question is, is if you pass in the business to the next generation, when's a good time to start the conversation? And I think that's now. Some of the things we would encourage you to do is uh, attend extension events like tonight. Kudos because you're doing that tonight or watching it here um, taped. Develop your goals. Think about your farm succession plan, whether it's that owner operator track or whether that's the landlord track. Get your will updated, your advanced directives. I will tell you from personal experience, the whole pulling the plug at the end of life is a conversation that you want to have way before anybody gets sick. Funeral plans need to be all planned out before anybody dies. Now, that grieving process is so intense, you're not going to make the same decisions that you would make if you were making them in a time where your mind is clear. And complete that getting your affairs in order like I showed you there on that document. Hold those family, family meetings and then complete your estate plan. So JT, I think I will just, um, maybe this will, be, this will help you, you all out over in Butler County, we're going to put up this poll. Now, I think this was poll number one, um, JT. What are the major issues that you need help with as you plan for the future of your farm? So, JT, if you can pull that one up, I think that's poll number one. Have you answer that real quick. And I believe you can do multiple ones, right, JT, maybe? Yes. Okay, so you can do multiple ones. Wait a few more seconds. Yeah, do you need help with the transition to state plants, transition the management to the next generation, how to split the farm when we have both on farm and off farm heirs, understanding the options, 
talking to my family about transition, how to select an attorney, how to get my affairs in order. So we got a great, um, I'm gonna end polling there for you, JT, and share the results. We got a great list there. Um, and I think the, the one that came out on top, there's 50% how to talk to my family about the transition to state plans. And that, that's exactly right. It's starting that conversation. Uh, if they have to watch the recording of this, because you have someone that you're like, you try to nudge, nudge them, have them, have them watch it, start that conversation. Uh, usually, you know, there's triggers in your life that you can all obviously see we had some triggers. Sometimes it's as simple as uh, the neighbor passes away and you've gone together as a family to the calling hours and funerals. You know, and sometimes that's all it takes to start that conversation going. So how to select an attorney, those are, and JT, those are programs that maybe you can have even this, um, the, we're getting this hang of this webinar thing. Those are webinars that could be for future, um, future opportunities there. So with that, uh, I, I'll leave you with these words and these words I'll try to put out there for you. There's my dad again, there's and my favorite dog, Maggie. Well, procrastination is not avoiding, not just avoiding a task, it's also avoiding the emotions that accompany an uncomfortable task. There's nothing very comfortable about talking about death and about what happens to the farm after you're gone. Uh, it's not gonna get easier by procrastinating. The measure of one's character is not what they get from their ancestors, but what they leave their descendants. And I'm not talking monetary things there. And then I find the days too short for all the thoughts I want to think, all the walks I want to take, all the books I want to read, and all the friends I want to see. Jay Burrow said that. Coolest thing about these three quotes, and I made the promise to my dad that I would share these. Uh, when my mom went to get his suit jacket and suit um, for his funeral, inside that pocket of his suit coat were these three quotes that you see on the screen. Now, I don't know if that was plan, um, plan, purpose, or divine intervention. But my dad, had, at his last school board meeting that he was at, he wrote these three quotes down and had stuck it in his suit pocket. What a great thing for me as his child to see those three quotes were three things that were on my dad's mind um, there as he was fighting pancreatic cancer. So I, I would hope maybe one of those quotes is your trigger as you um, think about your family's farm's future or it could just be your personal estate. Uh, so with that, JT, I'm gonna open it up um, for questions if you have time. We'll hit it right there at an hour. Um, the contact information there, I'm in Coshocton County, of course. Um, JT knows how to get a hold of me, track me down. But well, my email is marison.2 at osu.edu. Or my phone number here in Coshocton County is 740-622-2265. Um, our team um, from OSU Extension is here to help you. If you have those questions, uh, as, you, as you get into it, maybe there's future workshops and opportunities that you want to explore, just let us know, and we'll be happy to share those. So with that, JT, I'll handle any questions if there are some, and we'll also okay. be sending that um, recording out as well. I'm going to hit stop recording here real quick.